let me uh, just very quickly say thank you, everybody. This is the last um, of the academic year's uh, Spaceport Lecture, so I appreciate you being with us through um, the last two semesters. Um, we, uh, as usual, I'm, I don't have anything planned for the fall, but we will have by the time we get there. So we will start up again um, when the semester starts, probably our first uh, event. Well, our first event in September, just so you all know, September 12th is the 60th anniversary of the President Kennedy to the Moon speech at Rice Stadium. So we are working on a weekend long set of events. Um, we're still defining the details of that, but we've got, um, we're working with NASA and uh, we're looking to do a number of different things, including having a very special uh, Rice football uniform. But um, we will uh, keep everybody posted on that through the usual uh, email list. And uh, hopefully it will be a, a few things that you can attend yourselves. And uh, that will probably start our, our season uh, and then we'll have we'll, we'll go through and have uh, you know talks for the rest of it. So again, thank you. And um, if I don't get to see you, enjoy your summer and all that good stuff. So because we're kind of late, let me just jump straight to our speakers. So as as you know, we've been doing uh, this semester, we've been doing a bunch of different things related to uh, the exploration of of uh, space, in particular NASA's exploration of space. And uh, one of the key attributes of that next phase of NASA's exploration is the Artemis program and going to the moon. And uh, there's lots of different factors related to that, uh, one of which we're going to hear about tonight. So let me introduce tonight's speaker, Emma Lenhart. Um, Emma is the program planning and control manager for the Gateway program, which is what the topic of tonight. This is a small space station in orbit around the moon, or it will be and part of NASA's Artemis missions. In this role, Emma leads the team responsible for all business operations of the Gateway uh, program, including all the, all the boring but crucial stuff of budget, acquisition strategy, and contracts management schedules, cost estimating, information technology, and external engagement, um, as if she wasn't busy enough. And then previously, she worked at NASA headquarters, the White House's Office of Management and Budget, the Space Policy Institute, and consulting for government agencies and aerospace companies. She has an MA from the International Science, and Technology, Policy, in International Science and Technology Policy from George Washington University, a BA in politics with a minor in astronomy um, from Mount Holyoke College and attended the Space Studies Program of the International Space University, which is actually a fantastic program. We can talk about more about that, Emma, where you, where you did that. Um, but with that, um, I'd like to thank Emma uh, for putting up with us and, and some of the trials and tribulations here and really sorry that we we can't be in person um, and with that Emma I think I can pass the floor over to you and hopefully everything will work smoothly from oh let me just say again questions in the Q&A I will unmute you to ask your questions so that you can talk to Emma directly um, and if, if you wouldn't mind doing that uh, on the fly if you keep them to the end unless it's a clarification question if you're okay with that Emma Oh, yeah, that sounds good. Okay, um, then just let me know and I'll keep a tab on it. So thank you very much, everyone. Emma, the floor is yours. Um, thank you. Wonderful, Dr. Alexander. Thank you so much. Let me try the video one more time. I'm just going to click the button here. Nope. Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll roll without it. Um, I think uh, David mentioned that the reason we are here virtually today is, uh, is unfortunately due to COVID. Um, my, my husband tested positive. I have so far tested negative, but honestly have not been feeling 100%. <laughs> so I, I felt it was safest uh, to, to have this be a virtual conversation tonight. And, and I would just feel terrible if I got anybody sick. Um, honestly, it, it's a shame that my video is that working because I'm I'm looking pretty good tonight for having COVID, <laughs> but that's all right. Uh, so we are here tonight to talk about Gateway. Um, I love talking about what I do and my program, and uh, my preferred style, even in these virtual sessions, is to not have, spend too too much time on slides and uh, have plenty of time 
at the end for conversation and questions. Um, that's that's really where I find a lot of value uh, from these engagements. And honestly, it is helpful for me, since we are still a new program, for you to bring any and all questions that you have. We are still learning how to communicate who we are, what we are doing, and why we are doing all of this. So please don't hesitate with any of your questions. Um, I do have two screens up right now, so I can see the, the Zoom uh, dialogue in my secondary screen off to the side. So I, I will take a peek at the chat every now and then, but uh, I know David will be monitoring everything and we can have a nice Q&A session at the end. Uh, with that, let me jump into my slides. All right, so yes, we are here to talk about Gateway tonight. Uh, Gateway will be a small human-tended space station that will orbit the moon. Um, built with commercial and international partnerships. We think of it as an extension of the amazing international partnerships that we have established in low Earth orbit with the International Space Station Program and also the commercial partnerships that we have across the human spaceflight portfolio. Um, I, I will get into the nitty gritty of all of the pieces that you see in this uh, in this picture, uh, this artist's rendition on the screen right now, but wanted to step back before jumping into the specifics of Gateway and talk a little bit about the, the context of this space station. Um, Gateway is a, a really exciting piece of infrastructure, but when you look at all of the activity that we are planning on and around the moon in the next several years, uh, you can see that it's just one piece. Um, very exciting for us and something that we are watching is later this year, a CubeSat mission called Capstone. Let's see if you can see my, uh, my uh, cursor moving on the screen. Uh, Capstone will be launching later this year, a CubeSat mission that will fly in the intended orbit of Gateway around the moon to test out this unique NRHO near rectilinear halo orbit uh, around the moon before we get there. Uh, we also have a lot of activities with our commercial lunar payload services program. And of course, um, the, the first flights of Artemis, um, first an uncrewed flight test, and then Artemis II being the first crude flight test um, scheduled for, for 2024. Our first components of Gateway, and I will spend a lot of time talking about these, are called the PPE and HALO. And right now we are planning for those to launch together in late calendar year 2024. So lots of incredible activity on and around the moon. Um, and for us, that is our piece of the Artemis puzzle. So what is Artemis? Um, Artemis is uh, an inspirational campaign. Artemis is the twin sister of uh, Apollo in Greek mythology. Artemis is NASA's um, vision to launch, to launch and land the first woman and first person of color on the moon. Um, but it is also, programmatically a collection of programs that all have to work together. So I thought that this was helpful to see how Gateway plays in with the rest of Artemis. Uh, we have the Space Launch System rocket and the Orion Crew spacecraft that will be taking the crew uh, to the moon and, and back home again safely. The infrastructure of the Exploration Ground Systems program, those commercial lunar payload services, um, EVAs and human surface mobility, like rovers, pressurized and unpressurized on the surface of the moon, the gateway in orbit, and uh, eventually an Artemis base camp. So all of that comes together at, on, and around the moon to enable this Artemis campaign. But for gateway, <clears throat> we also see ourselves as the important stepping stone to going beyond the moon. Uh, we, our vision is our, that we will establish a vibrant and lasting human presence in deep space. And that means being the place where we can test uh, and build out all of the technologies 
capabilities, procedures that we will need for further deep space exploration with humans uh, eventually uh, for human missions to Mars. I see someone connecting to audio. I don't know if they're coming off of mute to ask a question, but at this point I'm gonna pause. Are there any questions so far? I, I don't see any in the chat just now. I think that was maybe some, oh, there's a hand up. Let me, um, let me go there. And it's from uh, Bill Rothschild. Let me, where'd you go? He just put his hand down again. Okay. Okay, if it, oh, wait a minute, there we go. I, I just want to unmute them so that I don't have to. So, uh, William, I'm allowing you to speak now if you want to ask your question of Emma. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is, will these uh, presentation materials be made available to us? They can be, yes. Uh, these will all be publicly available. Mm -hmm. are, they in the, are they suitable for public release? Are there any ITAR limitations? Uh, no, there are no ITAR limitations. All of these materials have been cleared for public release. So yes, I can provide them to David after the talk. Thank yeah, and, it is, and, the, and, and the, the lecture is being recorded too. So there's another opportunity if you wanted to, to, to watch it again. Um, but uh, we can, we're, we're, we have someone who, anyway, we're taking, a, taking away from your talk, Emma. Sorry, we can sort all that out later. So, so we can do that. Sure, okay. Thank you. Anyone, anyone else have a question? at the moment. I do see a, a fun question in the chat that I'm going to address. Um, is the designer of your logo from St. Louis? Uh, <laughs> no, uh, but my program manager, uh, Dan Hartman, is from St. Louis. And let me, I'm just going to flip back really quickly. Um, so this, this yeah. So, the, so sorry, Emma. Some people are answering, putting them in the in the chat. So I, I, I don't no know worries. if you read them to you or if you would like to. Yeah, this, this is a fun one, David. So I'll, I'll jump back for this one. Um, so the the gateway logo uh, in the upper right hand corner here uh, does look quite a bit like the gateway arch in St. Louis. That is by design, but it also is reminiscent of our. Uh, elliptical seven day orbit around the moon near rectilinear halo orbit. Um, so yes, very much inspired by St. Louis and the, and the gateway arch. Um, and we think that that is so poetic, especially given the symbolism of the gateway arch and the westward expansion and the start of exploration into the Western United States. And uh, obviously we see ourselves as, as serving as that kind of a gateway to exploration as well. And Melissa, would you like to would you like to ask your question in person? I'm I'm letting you speak now if you'd like to ask your question. This is Melissa Morse. Uh, Melissa, no. I need to voice it. Okay, we can come back to that question, Melissa, at the end. Okay. All right. So uh, let's see. So organizational charts are, are never the most exciting to brief, but honestly at NASA become absolutely critical for understanding who is doing what and, uh, and what's going on. Uh, we, we established officially the Gateway Program as a new program at the NASA Johnson Space Center a little over three years ago. Um, we have been rocking and rolling as a program since then. Uh, it takes quite a bit to set, stand up a new major human spaceflight program uh, in terms of all of the, the business operations of the program. And that is where my job uh, comes into play. Uh, you can see uh, my name in this tiny box on the left-hand side for um, program planning and control. Uh, essentially, I have everything that's not technical, not engineering, not the development of spaceflight hardware. And I'm getting an alert to maybe start my video. Let's give that a shot. Hey, all right, can you all see me? Okay. How are you? <laughs> Perfect, all right, uh, we'll keep going. Um, I don't know how that happened. I never did anything, so I can't take credit for it. So maybe you did something. <laughs> oh, I, I was able to find the setting. Okay, thank you. <laughs> this right. is Emma. This is Emma, everyone. Yes. Hello. Okay. 
Um, one of the, the other major attributes of our, of our program and, and what it took to get us uh, stood up, as I mentioned, that we were a multilateral program uh, that required signing uh, international partner MOUs, Memoranda of Understanding, with, uh, with several international partners, uh, the European Space Agency, the Canadian Space Agency, and the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency. The space agency of the government of Japan, of Japan. And those, honestly, that was a, a significant amount of, of work. We have an international partner manager who works for our program manager, and that was his entire life for uh, a significant amount of time uh, to get those uh, memoranda of understanding signed. That is a, um, a commitment from the government of the United States to these space agencies, uh, honoring the, the, the contributions and benefits that each will receive out of the partnership. Um, we also have all of our early element contracts in place across the program, except for our airlock. I'll touch on that a little, a little bit later. Um, and that includes everything that we are building domestically, as well as the contributions from our current international partners. <clears throat> All right, so we are focused right now on building what we call our initial capability of the gateway. These are the first two elements that will fly. Um, they will launch together. So this is the power and propulsion element. Uh, a little bit of a, a descriptive name there, I suppose. It provides the power and the propulsion for the entire gateway stack. It is a high power solar electric propulsion spacecraft. It will actually push the, these two pieces, PPE and HALO together out from their initial launch orbit to our destination at the moon, NRHO. And it will be our communication relay between the Gateway spacecraft and Earth. It is responsible for maintaining the Gateway's orbit for the duration of the life of the space station. The next piece, which is the, the tubular uh, piece here on the graphic is the habitation and logistics outpost, HALO. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll admit I was not expecting the engagement from uh, the people who play the game HALO online when we named it that, but we've certainly gotten uh, a lot of engagement from that community, which has been nice. Um, this is the first habitable volume of Gateway, the first place where astronaut crews can live, work, conduct research. It will be able to house four astronauts for up to 30 days when Orion is docked with the space station. Uh, it also has a communication capability, but in this case provides a high rate calm between Gateway and the lunar surface and back again. It has three docking ports, um, HALO does, to enable the future buildup of Gateway or visiting vehicles. We will also be flying early science. So when PPE and HALO launch together, they will have uh, at least these three instruments uh, flying with them. All three work together and all three um, help understand the true unique deep space environment that Gateway will be flying in, um, heliophysics, radiation space weather instruments. Uh, the first, Hermes, is built by the Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland, uh, so it's provided by NASA. Uh, the second, the European Radiation Sensor Array, is provided by Europe. And the third uh, is called the Internal Dissimilar Array, so dead giveaway, it flies on the inside of Gateway to be able to compare and contrast what the other instruments are sensing on the outside of the station. Uh, that is provided by ESA along with some components by Japan. And then we build from there. Uh, so we will go from the initial capability of PPE and HALO to an expanded capability that uh, is, is built up mostly by these contributions from our international partners. So all together, it'll end up looking like this. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time walking through these components of, of Gateway, and then I'm gonna try something with IT and we'll see how it goes. <laughs> um, so uh, if, if you can see my cursor, here we have the power and propulsion element and the habitation and logistics outpost, those first two pieces that will launch together. 
PPE is managed out of the Glenn Research Center in Ohio and actually built by a company called Maxar, and they're building that spacecraft in Palo Alto, California. Uh, the HALO is managed uh, here at the Johnson Space Center, uh, but is built by Northrop Grumman with some key elements provided by our international partners. The next uh, major piece moving along in a line here is what we call the IHAB, the International Habitat. Habitat. So it is another habitable volume of gateway uh, where astronauts will be able to live, work, sleep, exercise, conduct research, and that is provided by ESA, again with components from Japan. Another ESA component um, is, is this slightly differently shaped uh, component called the Esprit Refueler. That is a refueling module that will allow us to refuel plumbed through HALO the power and propulsion element. Uh, it'll also provide storage opportunities and critically for our astronauts, windows. So they'll have great views of both the lunar surface and the Earth from afar. Uh, we are envisioning that uh, every crewed mission will need some logistics resupply. So we are under contract with SpaceX right now to provide a logistics resupply service. And in the future, uh, we are hoping to define that ja JAXA will also be able to provide a logistics resupply service with a vehicle that they're calling the HTV-XG. The Canadians are providing what we call the Gateway External Robotic System, GERS. So that is not only the next generation Canada Arm, Canada Arm 3, but also all of of the components necessary on the outside of the, of the spacecraft for the arm to walk itself around. Okay. The crew will arrive and depart from Gateway in the Orion spacecraft. And there is also here a representation of a government reference human landing system. Though so the, the plan is that the human landing system, which ferries crew from Gateway to the surface of the moon and back up again, will aggregate at the gateway for future Artemis sustained missions. PPE and HALO, uh, these first two pieces are planned again to launch in late calendar year 2024. They will launch on a SpaceX Falcon Heavy rocket. Uh, the other major components that I walked through that are provided by our partners, um, such as IHAB and the Esprit Refueler module uh, will actually launch co-manifested with Orion on the space launch system. I didn't touch on the airlock off to the side here. Uh, we are currently in negotiations with an international partner to provide an airlock in the future. That would be both a crew airlock for astronauts to conduct EVAs on the outside of the space station, but also a science airlock, a smaller airlock, uh, where crew on the inside of Gateway could put experiments into that airlock and the arm could reach in from the outside, grab and deploy uh, on the outside of Gateway. Unfortunately, I cannot say too much more about uh, the, the airlock at this point in time. All right, I'm going to try to now show an animation buildup. I know that this is toggling between screens and showing a video over Zoom, which is always very glitchy. Let's see how it goes. So, oh, I need you to move. Okay. To run through how this all works, so the PPE and Halo come up together, they arrive in NRHO. The very next mission that comes up for Gateway will be the delivery of the IHAB, that's the ESA provided international habitation module, which will be delivered to Gateway with the Orion and four crew members inside. Um, that will be the very first time that crew enters the Gateway. They will be ingressing into both the IHAB and the HALO. Orion will depart and take the crew safely home after this first mission to Gateway. The next thing that will happen is a logistics resupply mission will come up to Gateway. Um, this time, this logistics mission is delivering the Canadian external robotic arm and it will deploy itself onto the outside of the space station. And a human landing system and HLS would dock to Gateway at this point in time. 
And now that we have the HLS there, the logistics, the Orion would come up and deliver the Esprit refueler module to Gateway. At this time, two crew members would go down to the surface on the moon of HLS, two would remain on Gateway, and then they come home again, and all four would return home on Orion. We're getting close to assembly complete. But first, we need to start the next sequence of missions. We will need a new logistics module to come up. So there we go. Bringing food, consumables, water, science to the Gateway Space Station. A new HLS docks to Gateway. And next should be the airlock being delivered by Orion again. Again, we have a sortie mission in HLS down to the surface of the moon and back up again. And Orion will depart to take the crew home. And there you have the current configuration of the gateway. I hope that worked. <laughs> this, this video is available uh, on our Twitter feed if you would like to find it. All right, just a couple more slides and then I would love to hear uh, what questions you all have or any other information I can share with you. We are getting some questions, so I'm saving- We are getting some questions, great, so, yeah. okay. So, I've, I've shown a lot of PowerPoint pictures and uh, animation graphic, graphics with a, with a blueprint design, but this is real right now. We have suppliers all over the United States, in fact, all over the country who are delivering flight hardware as we speak. The habitable uh, element, the structure of the halo is being welded in Italy. Um, some of our uh, rollout solar array components for the PPE uh, come from New Zealand. As you can imagine, we have had some impacts due to COVID, but uh, not like some of the other parts of NASA have experienced. Uh, it has been truly remarkable on Gateway how much progress we have been able to continue to make uh, in this two year period during the pandemic. And uh, our, our, my, la my last get off the stage slide is if you would like more information about Gateway, you will know how to get in touch with me, but our external facing website is nasa.gov slash gateway. And uh, we have recently, re relatively recently established social media accounts on both Twitter and Facebook, where we, uh, we intend to share content weekly, if not uh, more frequently, depending on what's happening in the program. And, and David, I know that was a little short, but again, I would love to spend time just talking to folks. So that is all I had prepared tonight. I think that's a good, I think that's a good rundown of, of uh, the basics. And I think it's nice to keep it clean the way you did, you know, so that people have that picture in their head. Um, so we have some questions in the Q&A and what I'll do is I'll go to them one at a time and, and allow people to talk and then the others, um, uh, please feel free to add your questions because you, know you know the price of not asking questions is you get to hear me ask questions and you don't want that, you want to participate. Um, but unfortunately, um, I do have to ask the first question because Melissa asked me to, she didn't want to ask you herself, she wanted me just to read her question to you that's been up there for a little while. And so I think generally the question is with, with all the countries involved in space flight, who decides who gets to use what space at what time um, in specific areas? So I guess it's a, a question about um, essentially space traffic management, you know, and how do, how do the countries work together to identify like uh, presume orbits and landing sites, particularly when it comes to the moon? And Melissa, if I'm, if I'm misrepresenting your question, uh, please correct me, but um, I think that's the general gist of the question, Emma, if you'd like to address that. 
Sure. So at at the moon right now, we don't have that much traffic where it would be a, a concern like it is in in Leo or Geo right now. Um, but one of the things that we have done at NASA in the last couple of years is establish the Artemis Accords, which are uh, nation by nation uh, accords establishing kind of an extension of the existing legal, international legal framework of uh, kind of, I, won't, I, don't want, I don't want to say rules of the road that has very specific meanings in space traffic management and international space law, but uh, expectations for behavior in space uh, and on the lunar surface. So that, that, that's about the extent of my knowledge in that area at this time. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, there, there are international agreements as to who yes. gets to launch where and, 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 and there's, a, there's a, you know, the certain responsibility areas and so on. And so far that's been, I mean, it's fairly well managed and everybody plays well together. Um, we'll see what happens if the moon gets more crowded, but that'll be a while. Right. And, and then, so, so um, what I'm going to go is go to the, the, the Q&A here. Daniel, I'm going to let you speak first. And I think... Um, if you wouldn't mind just asking your first question and then we'll come back to you for your second question and that way we don't have to, we can just do one question at a time. So Daniel, you should be able to speak now. Daniel, Daniel Roy, are you there? Yes. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to be sorry because I have a thick French accent, okay? So I will do my best. Uh, bear with me. How will the mission to the dark side, the supposed dark side, uh, be supported? Because I do not see any kind of uh, communication relay uh, like uh, the Chinese recently put in orbit. That is a great question. I could understand you perfectly. Uh, we have we have lots of international partners on, on Gateway and your accent is not that thick. <laughs> so, um, the dark side, the, the far side, the dark side. Um, I'm going to pivot slightly in my answer to you, Daniel. Um, the area of the moon that is of most interest to us right now is actually the lunar south pole. And that's for a variety of reasons. Um, there are deep craters at the lunar south pole where the crater rim um, is permanently sunlit. So that could be a good place to collect solar energy. And the interior of the crater uh, has never seen the sun. And that could be a, a good place for scientific uh, investigation of the materials deposited there over time at the moon. Uh, Gateway itself will be a communication relay with constant view of the Earth. So that is one of the benefits of, of the Gateway station itself, that it can provide that communication relay. Um, but one of the interesting things about your, your question is, you know, the, the lunar environment, the surface environment is very hostile, can be very, very warm, can be very, very cold. And for any surface assets that we are thinking of deploying that rely entirely on sunlight for power, uh, we have to do a lot of studying of something that we call survive the night. How do these assets survive the long lunar night um, without any sunlight for solar power? So that, that is all in work now, um, but the reason we are thinking of the Artemis base camp itself being located at the lunar south pole is to take advantage of those uh, natural resources and uh, capabilities that I mentioned. Emma, can I ask a quick, uh, yeah. so what's the orbital period of Gateway? Seven days. Seven days. Okay, right. so that's a fairly slow orbital turn, so. It is. Right. But but um, but Daniel, the you know the the far side um, is is Emma point of view. It's not there's there is no dark side of the sun. It's just a side we can't see. So it's the far side. And the fact that Artemis is orbiting the moon means it will have. If there was an asset on the far side, um, it would be the far side of the Earth, but not necessarily the. It wouldn't be completely out of view of of the uh, of the gateway, um, except for maybe for three and a half days, right, half the orbit. So, um, and actually, it turns out we're going to be we're going to be stuck with French accents this evening. I'm looking at who else is asking questions down the line. All right, let's we'll see how I do. I can make an announcement about the, some of the French stuff a bit later. So, um, thank you, Daniel, for that question. We'll be coming back to you um, a little bit later. Uh, the next I saw on the list was Phil. 
Uh, Phil uh, Constantine. So let me find your name, Phil, and then I can open you up to speak. Uh, P is further down the line, and there we go. And Phil, you can now ask your question of Emma. Phil, are you there? He's still on. Phil, can you can you hear me? <clears throat> All right. Well, 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 well. Phil's trying to um, get back. We can. I'll, I'll leave him. I can come back and ask his question if he's if he's just being shy. But the somebody. The next question is somebody you know. I'm not, I'm kind of loath to give him give him a mic. <laughs> Mark, Mark, you're Mark. You can ask your first question. I think you've got a second one later on. Mark, you can speak now. It appears that you are still muted, Mark. Yep. He's muted okay. himself. There we go. There, I'm unmuted now. And um, Phil said he didn't have a microphone, by the way. Oh, then I'll ask his question for him. Thank you. Right. Uh, so my, my, my first question is, uh, is the IHAB planning to have uh, region equals still? Still, I'm not sure that it ever did. Regen, regenerative environmental control and life support systems. Um, it will be necessary for very long-term stays at the gateway or future human missions to Mars. At this point, neither HALO nor I have, have fully closed regenerative ECLIS systems. And that is one of the reasons why we need those logistics resupply missions uh, when the crew is at gateway. And so I guess I'll, my follow-up question really is, more pertinent. Uh, so, how long are the is the long longest crew stay this with this reference configuration? With the initial configuration, so just PPE and Halo, the crew can stay there up to thirty days. That's with Orion docked. So we have a lot of shared capabilities uh, between Gateway and Orion. Toilets, exercise equipment. Um, that kind of infrastructure uh, necessary for, for humans. Um, so it, a lot of our initial capability is dependent upon Orion being there. Uh, okay, you good with that, Mark? Yeah, yeah. I was just wondering, um, the, they, the first two few missions don't, aren't planned to be that long. They're uh, no. just... Uh, Kitchen goes right. The um, particularly the the shakedown mission is short, right? So shakedown. So I when I typically use the word shakedown mission, I am thinking of a shakedown cruise, which is analogous to what navy ships do. Um, and when we think about a shakedown cruise at Gateway or a shakedown mission, we're actually thinking very Mars forward. We're thinking about a full. Uh, almost full analog of uh, Mars duration mission. So for that type of mission, what you would need is a very large, um, very capable habitable volume on at Gateway, which is not uh, depicted in my configurations that I showed tonight. No, so that would be I, I was capability. I was talking about the the uh, Halo I have uh, Orion combo where the cruise. Mm -hmm. can and then leave. That's that's what I consider the, or when I use the term shakedown, that's what I meant. You know, where they weren't actually going to the surface of the moon; they were just doing system checkouts and stuff like that. Yeah. So if we had a logistics mission on that flight, we would be able to extend it for a significant duration. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And so. Um, Phil doesn't have a microphone, so I'm going to ask his question for him, Emma, and you can read it in case I get it wrong. But will Gateway, so again, it's about the Gateway orbit, will it be in a geosynchronous, and I presume it means uh, lunar synchronous, um, will it be in a, a synchronous orbit around the moon? Um, will there be eventually be three satellites, so comms will always be available? So it's a bit related to the earlier question, too. Sure. So, um... There are several orbits of interest around the moon. Uh, low lunar orbit, distant retrograde orbit. We settled on NRHO, which is an elliptical orbit 
around the moon with the seven day period uh, that David just asked me about, because it is a very stable orbit that does not require a lot of energy to maintain. Um, it's easy to get into and it's easy to get out of, which is which makes it a good place for kind of gateway as a way station for visiting vehicles or things that would need to go uh, on further deep space exploration. Um, it is not a synchronous orbit. So I think I think I've answered Phil's question. Uh, David, let me know if I didn't do that uh, enough credit to what he was really getting after there. Yeah, no, no, I think, I mean, I think, I think people are worried, I think partly because of the Chinese mission, you know, where they actually sent a CubeSat so that they could communicate and they, they were wanting to explore on the far side. I think people have in their mind that that's going to be an issue. Now, one of the things that's happening, uh, the comms is going to be, especially as more resources go to the surface of the moon and go to different locations, comms is going to be a uh, uh, an issue and not all of it is necessarily going to be managed by NASA, right? Because NASA's got other things to do. Um, so for instance, uh, intuitive machines are thinking of putting their own uh, orbiting set of satellites to provide comms for the surface, but then oh. also to provide a relay back to the earth. So it won't be for control, but it will be for comms to the various resources around the surface of the moon. So, so it is an issue that people are speaking about. It is an issue that um, they see as important. Whether it becomes a NASA, I don't think I've seen anything like that in the NASA plans for Artemis, but it will be supported by the commercial plans because they're, they're, looking, they're looking to do a number of different things and Artemis is, uh, NASA is focusing on their kind of core exploration mission side of things. And so I think that's the, the distinction. So it's not that it's, no, it's, not, it's not being considered, it's just being considered for different, different reasons. So hopefully that adds a little bit to your, to your answer, Emma. Yeah. Um, so there, there is a question, if it's in the chat, I'm just going to read it out rather than try and find the name. So earlier on, um, uh, Arthur asked, where is the SpaceX lander? Well, I know it's in the it's in the factory, but I mean, <laughs> in your in your scheme of things, um, where does SpaceX and the and that selected lander fit in? Sure. So I'm I'm going to try very hard not to sound like a lawyer here. <laughs> so um, when you know when you look at the sequence of Artemis missions that are planned right now, and I think this might actually address one of the other questions I saw in the chat earlier. Um, the first Artemis mission, Artemis 1, which they're out doing a wet dress rehearsal right now for, um, will be an uncrewed test flight. Artemis 2 will be a crewed test flight. Artemis 3 will be a, what we call a direct mission. So that is um, Orion uh, bringing the crew directly to the SpaceX human landing system, which in this case is Starship. Uh, and that will land on the surface of the moon. Uh, the next mission, Artemis IV, is the, the mission that we were just talking about in terms of uh, mission duration with, with Mark Jernigan. And that is an Orion mission that delivers the I have and the crew goes into Gateway. But you notice in my buildup uh, animation, there was no human landing system um, there. So that mission is a Gateway only or an orbital only mission. After that, there will be uh, missions to Gateway and down to the surface of the moon, uh, those sortie missions every time the, the crew is coming back up again. Um, when we built these graphics, uh, the procurement strategy uh, was, was still in work for those future human landing systems. So we did not know um, if, if it would be a SpaceX Starship or some other capability. And honestly, at this point, um, we, the, the, the procurement is, is still in work and a little bit open. So that is why we relied on depicting the government reference design. Um, so it's honestly not to get ourselves in trouble as those competitions are underway. Thank you. And uh, I see Arthur typed his question in. Um into the Q&A too, so, um, but we, we did get that covered. So okay. um, I'm going to go to uh, another Frenchman, um, but his accent's fine, I think. Um, let me, Vincent, let me, let me open your mic and let you speak. It's good to see you. Where are you? 
There you go. Vincent, you can ask your question now. Do you want me to turn it on? I can do the French thing too. Can you speak up a little bit? It seems to me you're a bit quiet to me. I don't know if Emma can hear you clearly. I think she did. She laughed. Anyways, um, my question, Emma, thank you. It's a great presentation. Um, I'm curious about all the norms and specifications for all the equipment you're going to be bringing. Has that been set all through all the modules that you described? Is it going to be uh, international units or is it going to be U.S. units? I'm, I'm quite curious about how you manage that. And also, how big is your glossary uh, with acronyms? Oh, uh, <clears throat> I'll start with that last one. We we ditched a glossary. We ended up with a database, so that tells you how big it is. Um, I feel like that was a softball or a setup question, Vincent. Thank you very much. Um, obviously, with our international partners around the world, um, we we are not using Imperial on Gateway. We are using. A, 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 standard measurements, although one of our very early tweets was a, a comparison graphic of the size of Gateway to the International Space Station, and I did not catch in time that it was in feet. Uh, <laughs> we regret that one. Um, but uh, the, the reason I, I smiled so broadly uh, as you were asking your question is because one of the great things about Gateway is that we are using what are called the international interoperability standards. So you can actually Google these right now. I believe it's deep space standards, international deep space standards.com. And they are agreed to uh, international interoperability standards for things like docking systems. So these are out there. They are agreed to uh, multilaterally, uh, publicly available. So, uh, why is that great? Uh, we all know what we're building to, but it also allows for people who have other ideas for future components of the gateway to see what they would need to do to be compatible. So I hope that answers your question. It's great, thank you. Vincent, I know you've got a couple more questions and I'll, so I'll leave your, your mic on, but we'll come back to them in a little bit. And we are glad to see so many uh, uh, French speakers online because we, we, we are actually going to have a French um, space expert located at the Space Institute for two years. We're working with the French embassy. So we're excited about that. So we'll be all be getting used to the accents. So let me let me ask um, let me ask a question from the chat who's asked me to it's M Luther. I'm sorry, I don't know your first name. Um, uh, this was again from earlier. What is the estimated time frame for launch and the follow on expansion to the extent you illustrated? Yeah, great, great question. So the, the first launch of the first components of Gateway are planned for late calendar year 2024. Um, as of right now, the next component would not be delivered until about 2026. But then every year thereafter, um, with uh, a launch of the SLS with Orion on board, uh, we would be adding a component once a year after that. So that full configuration that I showed in my graphics and the, and the animation, if that worked, um, would take us through about 2028 through 2030. And I think there's a related question. Um, William Sherborne, I'm going to allow you to speak um, so you can ask your question. And if not, I'll ask it for you. But you should be able to speak now, William, if you unmute yourself. OK, perhaps not. Um, so the, the, the question, uh, Emma, is um, what year will the astronauts land and how long will they stay and what will they be doing? So I think that's particularly interesting. Yeah, um, that first mission, first boots on the moon, um, again, after Apollo, is planned for 2025 at this point. Um, when I, when I say the word sortie, uh, what I mean is basically a shorter, shorter mission duration, a quick trip. Um, these first landing missions, the first several, in fact, will be relatively short on the order of seven days. Okay, thank you. 
So let me let me see. I'll come back to I'll come back to you, Vincent, to ask. You're still on. Uh, you're still able to speak to if you unmute yourself um, to ask your next question. Although it's, it's another orbit question from Vincent. Maybe Emma can cover the orbit one quickly. She sort of answered. I was wondering what the distance from the moon the orbit was at, and, and I think you answered why it was set that way. My 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 other question is more: there are there treaties on how the moon will be exploited? Are all the missions that you're talking about um, scientific, and is there room for commercial endeavors on the moon at this point, or is that still up in the air? All right, so I, I will offer my personal opinion, noting that I have a policy degree, but that was a very long time ago, and I am not a, a space lawyer. Um, however, there are, there are a suite of international treaties, starting with the Outer Space Treaty, 1967, which really sets the foundation for expected behaviors um, and exploitation of space resources. Uh, my personal understanding of that legal framework is that, yes, there would be um, opportunities for commercial ventures on and around the moon. I don't see wh why that would be prevented by the current legal framework. Um, I would note that uh, in addition to the kind of uh, foundational set of, of international laws, there was also something called the Moon Treaty, uh, but the United States is not a signatory of that convention. Um. One thing I would add to that too is that um, there are uh, there is a, a big debate in some circles as to to whether this violates the aerospace treaty or not, and they can the U.S. has taken one approach. Um, there's two there's two countries with unilateral laws, at least two that I know of, that allow commercial entities to uh, mine resources on the moon and sell them. One is the United States, and the other is Luxembourg. Luxembourg. Um, yeah. And so uh, that's an interesting, I think the problem, the reason there's a lot of debate is not that, that, uh, uh, that it's just that the Outer Space Treaty is out of date because it was in those days, I don't think it was envisaged that anything but a nation state would go to the moon. And the idea was not to plant a flag and claim it for you know, the British Empire or something. So, um, so it, something needs to change to to catch up with the commercial activity um, because the commercial activity they're doing things for a different reason than say NASA or ESA or whomever so yeah so it's an interesting it's a really interesting in fact one of the there's a, a great decisions topic right now is to is a, a lot to do with this space law and how it's catching up so very interesting and Vincent you know you should be smart enough to calculate the distance of the orbit just from the fact that Emma said it was a seven day orbit so there's your homework you're going to go off and work that out it's just Kepler's laws man you can do it all right <laughs> Steve Steve Merriman we're coming to you uh, I'm going to allow you to speak so Steve you should be able to ask your question now oh okay thank you uh I was wondering in looking at your uh, pictures of the assembly, you showed the uh, automated arm is carried up by the logistics module and it sort of deploys itself and is used for the assembly and construction. But do we anticipate an actual EVA presence for construction up there? I mean. For construction, EVA presence. As part of construction. After? No. Yeah, not for construction. Uh, in the future, for maintenance, we do believe that that will be necessary, but no, not for construction. Okay, okay. Back in the old days, I remember all the old, uh, the old line Apollo guys who had, well, around the time of ISS, they were all saying uh, EVA is only a contingency. That's the only one. And we kind of changed on that, you know, and then the, then the shuttle wound up really being a very much of a, I guess what I'm looking at here is I'm trying to, we don't have a shuttle anymore. And I'm trying to look at this scenario of building and imagine the capabilities of the shuttle that we don't have and what this scenario supplies uh, to do that. 
you know, because I always think of the shuttle is always treated as a payload carrier or mm -hmm. uh, or crew, but it's really also a robotic uh, assisted uh, construction platform too. And and that always seems to fall out of the discussion. But, uh, but okay, I was just uh, interested in uh, finding out what they were planning on that. I, the, the short answer is that we have come a seriously long way uh, with automated rendezvous and docking. And, and that is the plan for Gateway. Colin, Colin George, how are you doing, Colin? You are unmuted if you would like to ask your question that you had in the chat. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Alexander, and thank you, Emma. So my question is, uh, I've seen uh, some plans initially for some of the surface missions that didn't include Gateway, and now I've seen gateways now back in the mix. Um, so I'm curious, will all NASA crew flights to the surface uh, stop at Gateway? And would there be ever standalone missions to Gateway only? Um, or will the Gateway just be as a kind of stopping point along the way to the surface? Uh, great question, Colin, thank you. Yeah, um, after that very first 2025 landing mission, all subsequent uh, expeditions to the surface will go through Gateway. Uh, that is per our requirements on the book today, on the books, plural, today. Um, and, and yes, even in our current manifest and, and planning uh, for the buildup of Gateway, there is at least one mission, uh, that delivery of the International Hab, which is only a Gateway mission. So the crew will be uh, delivering the IHAB and uh, being, staying, uh, outfitting, getting the rest of the station ready uh, only at Gateway and not going down to the surface on that first, on that mission. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Um, so we've got three questions at the moment in q and I think what we'll do is ask I get those three questions uh, asked and answered, hopefully, and then that will call it a day, Emma, so that we're not here all night, because I know I can tell in your voice that you're a little bit hoarse there. So uh, <laughs> I have some water. I'm OK. Well, I, appreciate, I appreciate you, you know, your stalwartness and, and joining us given given what's going on. So so, Daniel, I'm going to come back to you again um, and then then Mark again. And then we're going to go to Keisha to finish. So, Daniel, let me find you. You can speak now and ask your question. Daniel, there you go. Wonderful. Well, um, you say you're not a lawyer, but I appreciate the way you handle the subtle questions. Uh, I just want you to know that I was 21 for Apollo 11, and your picture of the HLS uh, brought very nice memories to me. That's when I fell in love with the United States. Now, I have another subtle uh, policy questions for you, which I'm sure uh, your uh, training will be able to handle very well. Are there contingency plans in case SLS gets in any kind of trouble, political or uh, technical trouble? In terms of our ability to launch the components on the of the gateway on another launch vehicle, is that the question? Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Launching the I have the Esprit Refueler module and the airlock are uh, in our baseline plan. Uh, currently going to fly on SLS as co manifested payloads with Orion. Um, but we know the size of those, and we do believe that they would be able to fly on commercially provided uh, launch services should the need arise. Uh, but that that is me stepping uh, very outside my comfort zone to answer that question, because indeed the baseline plan is to launch on SLS. And uh, I don't think I flat out said there that those are contingency plans because uh, it's, a, it's a capability that exists on the market. But but yeah, we're planning to fly on SLS. So I, even though I tried to get you the sympathy for it, there's still more questions coming in. But I, I forgot, Phil had asked a question earlier that I forgot to, to ask, and he, he's, he doesn't have a mic. So let me jump to Phil for a second. So he, he left NASA in 1974, so a um, little, little year or two ago. Um, and there's, there have been lots of announced dates and projects since then um, that never happened. 
how firm are the dates you have mentioned, uh, for example, 2024? Yeah, so my, my program manager, Dan Hartman, has, has said this publicly in conversations with the NASA Advisory Council, for example, that our schedule, uh, particularly for the launch of those first two components, is quite aggressive. Um, we are pushing very hard. That means that there is schedule risk. And part of my job at this point in time is actually developing our cost and schedule integrated model, models uh, that will give us a better sense of, of what we really need to commit to for our cost and for our schedule for those first two pieces. NASA major programs and projects are required to, to do these analyses and to set uh, commitments to our external stakeholders, to the White House and to Congress and to the American taxpayer. Um, so we are still technically in gateway in the formulation phase. And as we are going through our preliminary design reviews, um, this programmatic cost and schedule work is ongoing, and this summer we will be establishing what we really think those uh, cost and schedule commitments will be. A little bit of a long-winded answer, but I can't resist talking about those cost and schedule models, and I'd be happy to answer any other questions that you have on those. So if you don't mind, that raises another interesting question about the, uh, the effect on the timeline because of the international partners who are committing to deliver certain parts and either way either direction right if, if the us is falling behind yeah. what does that do to them and vice yeah. versa so uh, what's the contingency plan there it, it's it's a delicate balance it is a constant communication and negotiation um but at at this point um we are not seeing anything in our international partner schedules that alarms us okay they're they making great progress. Great, great. All right, um, Mark, I'm going to uh, unmute you again. It's probably time I find your name. It's probably quicker, but there you go. Mark, you can ask your question. Uh, so my, my final question was, um, do you guys have um, a uh, Leo to Gateway transfer vehicle on the books yet? Is that uh, something in the strategic plan for Gateway, or uh, have you guys not um, thought that far out? A LEO to Gateway transportation vehicle. So I'm, I'm a little puzzled, oh. and I'm thinking about the Neil Stevenson book, Seven Eves, well, when you asked that question. Well, let, me um, you, let, me, let me give you the context. So okay. um, we, uh, you know, Axiom is in the process of uh, putting together a commercial station and uh, there, there's certainly a potential that um, commercial uh, programs will uh, want to uh, go out to the gateway for, or to become part of the supply chain to the moon. And of course, Axiom would also love to be a node in the supply chain because, you know, the more nodes you have, the smaller the spacecraft you can have in, in terms of uh, delivering all the things you need. So I was just wondering if um, you guys had given any thought to um, completing the supply chain by having a vehicle that goes back and forth from the moon to Leo. Not directly, but uh, I will say that uh, the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, we have a team called Deep Space Logistics, and uh, they manage our gateway logistics services contract. The first provider there is SpaceX, but uh, just last Friday or the week before, I've lost a little track of time, uh, we released a request for information for a potential on-ramp to that contract, and it did ask for companies to, to, to come back to us with questions that they have or ideas and things that have changed in the commercial landscape since the initial contract award. So that could be something that we discuss in the future. Well, yeah, uh, I, the other thought I had was the PPE, right? It's the, mm -hmm. the first um, uh, low, pro low propellant um, transfer vehicle. And uh, you, you, you haven't bought copies of those, have you? Or do you have no. that? Do you have a replacement schedule? No. Or any of that kind of mm -hmm. stuff? It can be refueled. So that's the plan. 
Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm going to, um, I think uh, I'm going to go to Vincent instead of Keisha, because I think Keisha's question um, in particular is a good one to finish on. Um, and it's related to uh, Mark just brought up PPE. Um, mm -hmm. And so Vincent, um, I'm going to open your mic again. Um, and you can ask your PPE question. Yeah. Yeah, PPE for us is uh, protective equipment in your oil and gas business, but anyways. Um, I, I, I'm curious, uh, what is the, uh, the power uh, system uh, to propel the, uh, that, that module? Uh, you, you said it needs refueling. So the, just a, a question, is it, is it a jet-based uh, system? And, and, and what's, the, what's the, the gas or whatever you're using? And why does it need refueling? Mm -hmm. Yep. So it is a solar electric propulsion spacecraft that provides uh, roughly 60 kilowatts of power, but it also has a, a xenon system. So that is what would be refueled. Thank you. Yeah. And xenon is expensive now because of headlights. But anyway, yeah. that's a so I just found that out last week. Um, so, okay, so, so Keisha, Keisha has uh, asked me to ask her questions, which is two questions. And I, I just want to ask the, um, the second one first, um, which is um, if lunar regolith resources uh, gathered on the moon will be taken back to the gateway for research and examination, um, I presume that would be a potential alternative uh, to bringing them back to the earth. So that, that's the question about the, uh, the sample return approach. So <laughs> we are we are currently talking about some of that architecture and what it would take uh, in our current budget cycle internal to the agency. So I'm taking a pause here to think about what I can and cannot say. But the it's a good question. Um, if if you are ever able to visit the Johnson Space Center and go on a tour, we have an entire Astro Materials lab and the proper curation and uh, research facilities necessary for uh, lunar samples uh, takes quite a bit of space and dedicated equipment. Uh, we currently do not have that type of space on the gateway, um, but, but we could bring samples home through the gateway um, with cold stowage and other necessary uh, things that we would need to preserve those samples on their transit back to Earth. But I like the idea of the future, it would just require um, some additional capabilities on the gateway. Yeah, I mean, there's a challenge because right now they basically shave a little bit off a rock and send them around the world because the facilities yeah. required are pretty substantial. Yeah. And, and then the last question, and the reason I left us to last is because again, it's maybe on the uh, you know, the kind of your, your bailiwick, if you like, um, um, given that there's a range of uh, potential missions to the moon by different countries and different partners. Um, so Keisha's question is, the US, Russia and China have missions to the Lunar South Pole. Russia plans to launch Lunar 25 to the Bogoslavsky crater in August. Will this have an impact on Gateway? No, it will not. Um... Very early conversations were held uh, with, with Russia for participation in, in Gateway, and Russia is not participating in Gateway at all, and I, I do not see how those uh, independent missions would have an impact on our plans or the way we're going to operate um, our multilateral space station. Yeah, I think that kind of thing goes back to the first question that we had too, and, and uh, you know, how the treaties get defined as more and more people go to the same kind of same location. It really is a very interesting topic, actually, in many, many different facets. And so I really appreciate um, all the questions and certainly appreciate um, Emma taking the time. And I, we do owe you a dinner, so we'll do that <laughs> at some point. But um, uh, again, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you very much, Emma, um, uh, you know, you know, being the, you know, you work, you could work for the postal service, right? I mean, nothing stops you. So um, <laughs> again, thank you all. Um, and thank you for that. Keep your eyes on what's happening. This moon is the, the moon, NASA and the moon is a big, a big, uh, exciting area for many different reasons. And uh, we need people like Emma and our colleagues you know, work, doing the great work that they do. So um, again, uh, if I don't see you on campus or elsewhere, um, uh, 
everyone have a great summer um, and keep your eyes and ears and uh, emails open for our next sequence of talks, um, which will start in the fall and any other events that we're starting to put on. Um, and again, thank you all. Uh, have a great rest of the evening and uh, enjoy your, your holiday weekend. Um, as I said, just don't make sure all your eggs aren't in the one basket because otherwise we're in trouble. So we'll see you all. And uh, again, thank you all. Thank you, Emma, very much. Thank you, David. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, and give my best to Chris. Hope he's, uh, and I hope you are on the way to recovery soon too. We both are. Thank you very much. Great. Okay. Thank you all. Bye-bye.